And Bob's still an alcoholic. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. The laurel wreath was used both by the Greeks and the Romans that signified that you've arrived. Mm. When the, the, the Greeks were the first ones to uh, award the, the laurel <laughs> wreath, and they did it to athletes. With the laurel wreath came certain privileges, uh, and the Romans took it to a new level. Uh, when you got the laurel wreath in Rome, you were vested in land. You never had to work again. You were a citizen of, the, of Rome. You were, you, if you, you could, you were actually, you could participate in the, in the Senate, all that stuff. You were, you arrived. And we rest on our laurels. Um, is an easy thing to do. One of the things that, that happens to guys like me, and I've watched this in others repeatedly, is very subtly, um, as you get more and more comfortable, as you practice the program, what happens is, as I get comfortable and happy, the sense of a problem in my life seems to diminish. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a very human thing. Uh, there's a great, if you ever get a chance, I think it was the, maybe the first grapevine ever published. It was either the first or set, one of the first couple. Dr. Silkworth did an article on relapse, and he, he used a great analogy. He compared relapsing from alcoholism to uh, chronic heart disease. He said when you have... Uh, when you have chronic, chronic heart disease, you don't know you have it until there's a crisis. And usually it comes in the form of a stroke or a heart attack. And then what you get a stroke, it's like this thousand pound weight slams you in the chest. And if you're lucky, you end up in the cardiac unit and they'll stabilize you. But that is not an end to itself. And they will give you a reg regimented program in order to live comfortably and safely and it'll involve diet it'll involve exercise it might involve blood thinners it might involve different medications uh, but what what happens to heart patients that do that is that in no time at all they start feeling better than they've felt in a long time because they're exercising they're eating right they're doing all the stuff they should have been doing all along and so they're feeling better than they've ever felt maybe they're jogging Maybe they're out running seven, eight miles a day. And they, you start to get feeling like you're bulletproof after a while. And say one night you go out with a bunch of guys, maybe younger than you. And you're going out, to, you're in a bowling league and you're bowling and you're, 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 you're beating them. You're, and you start realizing, I'm in better shape than these younger guys. But they're sitting there and they're eating these cheeseburgers that just look really good. Now, you're not supposed to have cheeseburgers. But these look, these are exceptional cheeseburgers. And I've been good all these, all these months and months and months. And then the, the conversation starts. Always starts with a conversation, doesn't it? An alcoholic, write, if you're new, write this down. An alcoholic having a conversation with himself is in a lot of trouble. <laughs> trust me, trust me. It always starts with the conversation. The conversation goes, man, I'm in better health than these guys. Why can't I have one cheeseburger for God's sakes? I run seven, eight miles a day. Everything, I feel good. Why not? Look, give me a cheeseburger. And then the worst thing of all happens. You eat the cheeseburger, and you know what happens? Nothing. Nothing. Right. No. And it's like a key turns in your head, and you start the road of compromise incrementally, slowly. You, you, you just don't, you don't go to being spiritually fit, helping guys, having commitments, working with a sponsor, doing step 10 and 11, to picking up a drink, or a drug overnight. That's that's. This is a slow incremental shift. Is the resurgence of ego and self, the resurgence of control. 
And I think that we get, I think the road to relapse is, is a road that we're seduced into by the very fruits of our own recovery. Alcoholics Anonymous has good news and bad news. The good news is that if you work the steps and you dedicate your life to uh, trusting God, cleaning house, and helping others, that you're going to get very comfortable in life. You're going to get happy. Things are going to go good for you. Things are going to click. You're going to get the jobs you always wanted. You're going to, I mean, things, you're just going to be a magnet for good luck. The bad news is if you work the steps and you trust God, clean house, and help others, is you're going to start to feel really good and things are going to start to work for you. And it's so human to just start to let, it's so, the book says, easy to let up on the spiritual program of action. Do you ever, how many people in here have relapsed more than once? Okay, you'll, you'll get this. On day one or two of being sober, do you ever feel more alcoholic than that? <laughs> Sure. I'm in detox shaking it out. Man, I got a bad case of alcoholism. Now, what? how alcoholic do you feel with a half million dollars in the bank or a job where you're making a hundred grand a year and you got the relationship and everybody's patting you on the back and telling you how smart you are and you think, I must be that else. Why would they tell me? And all of a sudden, you don't feel as alcoholic as you did when you were in that detox. And yet you are. Alcoholism didn't go away because you you became happy or successful. Really is easy to let up on this program of action. Arrest on laurels. The book says we're headed for trouble for we if we do. For alcohol is a subtle foe. I've tried to find a common denominator in in people that relapse. What's the common denominator? Because it's it's very elusive. Some people you'll hear people say in meetings, well they stop going to meetings. That's not true. I know many people who went to meetings and drank the same day that they were. I, that I've heard people say, "Well, they stopped praying." That is not true. I know people that have begged God not to let them get high, and they got high that day. I know. I, I know many people in the program that used on the way to the bar, the liquor store, or the drug dealer's house, they would pray and ask God to stop, them, and they went anyway. Um, but. Every single case of, that I've seen of people relapse, it's always back into the default position of self and they stay there for a while. But how do you tell? How do you know that that's the case? One of the major evidences of it is that they're, they stop serving the primary purpose of helping others and start serving themselves. And I, I, I've come to a conclusion based on my own experience in observing others. I think as an alcoholic, I am compelled to serve something. I can't help it. And if I don't serve God and the primary purpose of helping others and a set of principles and an ethic greater than myself, I'm going to serve myself. It's just automatic. I stop doing that. I just automatically go back into self-serving. I don't have to even try. It's almost like my self-centeredness has a bungee cord on it that just all continually pulls me back. Continually, continually, continually. Down at the bottom of page 85 starts the section on step 11. And the reason I know that is it says step 11 in italics. <laughs> Of all the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, this was the only one when I was new that I warmed up to. It was the only one. I, uh, I The idea of inventory just, oh, God, it seemed so tedious to me. I didn't, felt like punishment. i got to write. And the idea of making amends did, I didn't, did not warm up to that. But meditation, the idea of meditation, I kind of got excited about. Because I was a child of the seven, six, late 60s and 70s. We did meditation. Medi what would you do meditation for? So you could spiritually rise up above everybody else and look down on the spiritually deficient. Right? And my ego liked the idea of meditation. And I used to, I went into, oh God, in my drinking days, in and out of different meditation groups, TM, uh, Divine Light Mission, all, all kinds of stuff. A yoga, different types of yoga, and 
And in the meditation cl classes was always a great place to buy some good pot. And you, you had a very strong up chance of getting laid in a yoga class. I mean, there's it just I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, it, and so and plus when you when you were in a group of people that were meditating or doing yoga, you kind of knew that you were had risen above the rest of <laughs> the rest of pathetic humanity, right? And I got an ego that gravitates to stuff like that. So I like the idea. So I, I'm at, uh, I get to the book and I'm going to get into meditation. And I get to the bottom of 85 and I'm, I'm ready. It says, step 11, suggest prayer meditation. Okay. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. Okay, I'm buckled in. I'm ready. <laughs> and here's what it says. Here are the definite and valuable suggestions on prayer and meditation. When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? I remember reading this and thinking, what is this about? <laughs> this is not meditation. There's, it doesn't even give me anything to chant. Uh, no breathing exercises, uh, no visual imagery. This is inventory. I remember at one point having a fleeting thought, it's a misprint that should have been on the previous page with step 10. Matter of fact, it's, it's actually, that paragraph is a more in-depth self-examination than the one we continue to take in step 10. It's very, this is very in-depth self-examination. And then I read further on down the page, confused and thinking, God, there's got to be something in here about meditation, and I don't find anything. I find... A couple prayers. There's one that says we ask God to direct our thinking. There's another one we ask God for inspiration. There's another one on page 87. We ask especially for freedom from self-will. We may ask for ourselves. I mean, there's prayers, but nothing that... I mean, I know about meditation here. And one of the problems with guys like me who are very egotistical and write about a lot of stuff, if if... I, I know so much that's not true that there's no room to learn anything new. So what did I do? I did what an awful lot of us in AA do. I did it with the fourth step, and I did it with the eleventh step. I just threw the directions aside and started to try to figure it out on my own. And I went through years and years in, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous trying all kinds of stuff. I, I went through my... Uh, I used to read the day by day in the 24 hour book. I, I, I eventually started reading the prayer of St. Francis in the 11th step and the 12 by 12, good prayer. I, I found a different version of it that I, I did for quite a while that, where it says, instead of make me a channel, it says make me an instrument. I like that version for some reason, it clicked with me better. I, uh, I, I went to different churches. I, I, I said the rosary at one point because out of my childhood, just think, well, I'll try that. And, didn't really do much for me. Um, I uh, I did. I went to some yoga classes. I went back to SGI and chanted in Namni Yoho Renge Kyo with the Buddhists. Uh, did breathing exercises. I did visualizations. There's a, a meditation exercise I'd I'd learned years ago. It's with well, the elevator where you 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 kind of you relax yourself into a state of where you're you're separate from the chatter in your head. And it's it's a very cool deal. And uh, and it's all good. All of this stuff's good. Matter of fact, the bottom of page 87, it says it's all good. It says the last line in the last full paragraph, it says, be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they have to offer. In addition to, the problem is I'm doing it in substitution for. And so I never did what it said on page 86 and every 87. Well, I had a guy, a sponsor, come to me one day, and he was very serious, and he wanted direction on meditation, on step 11. Well, the problem is I've done so, by this time, I'm, I'm somewhere between 15 and 20 years sober. I've done so many things over the years. 
that I don't really know what to tell him. Because it, it, it's all good, but none of it's a home run, really. I mean, there's nothing that has stood out in the years of all doing all this different thing, all exercises and things that was definitive for me. That, that I could say to him it genuinely and honestly, this is the deal. This is what you do. So I did. I said to him what they – I'm going to let a little secret out. They they teach you some things in sponsor school. I don't know if you guys have sponsor school in, in, in Salt Lake. But in sponsor school, they teach you when a sponsee comes to you and asks you a question and you don't have a freaking clue. You, there's two answers. One is uh, pray about it. If your sponsor ever says, pray about it, what he's really saying is, I don't have a clue. I have no, I don't know. The, and, and the second answer is, uh, just do what it says in the book. If your sponsor says, do what it says in the book, he's really saying, I don't have a clue. I, so I said, just do what it says in the book. And, well, he actually did it. He, didn't have, he, he put his opinions aside and started every night doing the, a self-examination on the top of page 86 and then on awakening and, and to do the prayers and the things that we're supposed to consider for the day and all that stuff. And, and it, it seemed like in no t he seemed like in, no, in a short period of time he was kind of doing a little better than I was doing, which I don't really like that very much. I, uh, and what, I think what was happening is he was line, aligning himself and realigning himself on a daily basis with the decision we make in step three. And what is the decision we make in step three? Isn't it that we're deciding to head our life in the direction of self-abandonment and service? Self-forgetting. I'm going to help God's kids. I'm going to leave my life alone. I'm going to help you. I'm going to love you. I, I've, I've messed myself up, focused on me. Uh, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's the decision. And it takes a lot of step work and a lot of stuff just to get, I think, just to get in the zip code of carrying it out, not even to really get it perfect, just to get in the zip code. And what happened is he's in the zip code. He's in the zone. And things are clicking for him because he's out of himself. He keeps pulling himself out of himself, and he's helping others, and he's, he's more effective at work because he's not there. It's not all about him. He's not going to work criticizing people he's going to work helping people things are working in his life very well and so I started doing it I started doing it uh, I didn't want to tell him that I, I never did it I just started doing it uh, Al, Al has a saying he says you got to make it your idea and I made it my idea and I start because I watched him and I and I sometimes it, it's some I don't know there's a Funny thing that happens, I don't know if it's so much I want what you have or I'm just tired of what I got. You know, it's, it's, or maybe it's a combination of both. But I, uh, I started doing it, and my life started, I started experiencing some, some cool stuff. Uh, I was starting to be a little more level, even keel. Uh, I was starting to catch myself when I was starting to get back into extreme self-involvement again. And, I, started, I would catch myself more frequently when I was being judgmental. Well, about the same time, um, a guy that I, I knew had a, found a dictionary in a store, a used bookstore, from 1913 or 16. Well, I don't know. One of those dates. It was either 1913 or 1916. I started collecting them. I just got picked up one from 1935. I got one from 1895. I got one from 1932. Um, and what we... He, we looked up the definition of the word meditation in this old dictionary, and it became very apparent to me that what that the definition of the word meditation had changed in the English language somewhere in the uh, '60s, with the Beatles, uh, with the Maharishi, with Alan Alan Watts, with J. Krishnamurti, with Aldous Huxley, with Timothy Leary, with Ram Dass. We had a, a resurgence of people that were that were delving into Eastern spiritual techniques and then presenting them to the West, to England and the United States especially. And so the definition of the word meditation changed in the English language. In 1913 or 16, whenever that dictionary was, it, 
it talked about meditation as, as if it was not some kind of ethereal thing to stop your mind, but it was a contemplating, focusing exercise. It used the example, it's, and the, this example helped me a lot. It said, a general will meditate a war. And then I started reading the second paragraph on 86 in, with that in mind. And it says, on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider the plans for the day. And the night before, he has taken an inventory of his army. He's facing a battle. Only the battle is with us is not with an, an, some other army. It's with this propensity to play self, to play God and, and get into self. That part of us that wants to run the universe that creates the conflict and separation with others. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced, which implies that I must be married to self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. I, I've spent a lot of my life with self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Did you, ever, that, did you ever have that experience? Somebody doesn't do, your, do it your way, so you take your toys and go home? <laughs> Self-pity. Dishonest. How we tell it. Something happens, and I, I start creating a story in my head about what happened. That After you play it through about 20 times, it's, it's not even what happened anymore. But you believe it. I, 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 don't, I don't only tell myself good stories. I enjoy them. <laughs> and self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our army, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave his brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. And I, could, I, I started to get it. That I am trying to realign myself into a state of, of maximum service. The book says at one point our real purpose is to grow in, a, in understanding and effectiveness. We're to, to, that I'm trying to become the guy who can carry out the decision in step three, uh, the, the, the move towards self-abandonment, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to forget about me. Self-forgetting. And I, I think that uh, these two aspects of the 11th step, this self-examination at night coupled with this vision of how I'm going to go about the day in the morning work together very much like what a sailor will use to navigate the ocean. If you were to go down to uh, the coast, to California, and you were to go to the nearest port, let's say that might be Marina del Rey, possibly, and and you were to go to Marina del Rey and you were to purchase or rent the, the absolute finest sailboat available. And you were to go to the nautical library and you were to be very diligent with the first nine steps of navigation, charting an impeccable course for the island of Maui. Every, you're you're going to set out from the harbor. You're in the best boat you can get right on, the, right on it for Maui. Every single day, the winds and the tides and the currents are going to move you off that course. It's not because you're a bad guy or you have a bad boat or you played with your tiller too much or nothing. It's just the way it is. And every day, if you're a diligent and responsible, and responsible just means to respond, a responsible sailor, you will get out your GPS or your sextant and your compass or whatever, and you will take an honest reckoning. The book says earlier we can't fool ourselves about values. An honest reckoning at where I'm at. And then and maybe you say, oh my God, I'm so back into myself again. I'm judging people. I'm resentful. And how do you get that? How do you get the honest reckoning? Well, we ask ourselves these questions at night. Was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do I owe an apology? Have I kept something to myself which should have been discussed? Am I creating a secret life again? Alcoholism is like a fungus that often only can grow in the dark. 
Was it, this question makes me crazy sometimes. Was I kind and loving towards all? All? <laughs> well, wait a minute. Some people don't deserve it. Listen. Listen. I'm kind and loving towards the people who deserve I'm kind and loving towards the people that are kind and loving towards me. Get the me position. But it says towards all. And in order to be kind and loving towards all, wouldn't I have had to abandon my will and my judgment of others? Wouldn't I have had to have given it up? It's love and service without prejudice. Hard thing. That's a hard question. I, on, uh, there's very, very few days that go by when I ask myself the question, was I loving... Uh, kind of loving towards all where someone <clears throat> doesn't pop into my mind. Now maybe I, I don't owe him an amends. Maybe I don't owe him an amends because I, I kept my mouth shut but instead of being kind and loving I was withdrawn and I gave him kind of the cold shoulder because I didn't like him. I, the best I could do at that point was that restraint of tongue and pen but I was not kind and loving. And I'll tell you what, I, what I've discovered is that I think God throws endless opportunities in my life to be loving to people, to be a bright spot in somebody's life that's having a bad day, and I react to their to their crap, and I miss it. I miss it. I've caught a few of them, and the one, the few that I've caught have just blown my mind. You know, I worked I, in the retail business for a lot of years, and sometimes I would get customers that were just awful I mean if you work with the public you know every once in a while you get somebody that's having a really bad day and they want to take it out on you and sometimes I'm, I'm ashamed to say I'd react to them and I'd be just as caustic as they were with me and on a few occasions I would see through the facade and the defense mechanisms of the ego and I would see the pain and I would start to talk to them like somebody could talk to me if I was in the midst of a bad day. And I wa I've, I've watched on a couple occasions people's attitudes shift because somebody's, they're, they're connecting with me. See, because I've, God knows I've had my bad days. If, if anybody should understand somebody having a bad day, you'd think it'd be me. What's it say in the book? An alcoholic properly armed with information about himself can be of help to another alcoholic when no one else can. I think not only to alcoholics, but I think we can be help to a lot of people. When if you're awake and you get it, can you are you awake enough to see through the defense mechanisms that are that are irritating you? Can you see what's underneath? Can you see the truth? Or do you just or do you want to listen to the clamor of the ego that just wants to tell you how you should treat them and retaliate and what you should you know, the thing that plays God. There is, there is a greater consciousness to be had here. Unfortunately, I don't know anybody, like it says in the book, no one among us has been able to maintain anything like. But man, I'll tell you something. If you're, you get a glimpse of this stuff once in a while when it's clicking, and I, that's the guy I want to be. I don't want to be the guy that's reacting to your BS. It's being a part of your problem. I want to be the guy I was that one day when I was, I was a piece of God's solution for you. Now, I can't do that with, with a great regularity, but I, I think as we practice this stuff and practice it, the book says we practice these principles in all our affairs. As we practice this stuff, the promise is it becomes a working part of the mind. Not once and for all. You never arrive here. But I think diligently over the years is that I, I start to get it more often. Maybe, maybe, at one, maybe when I was 10 years sober, I, I caught one out of 100. Now may, maybe I catch 20. Maybe I'm awake for 20. 20 is a lot better than one, I'll tell you. Maybe I'll get to some point where I can What if I could catch half? How lit up are you from the ones you catch? How lit up could you be? What if you caught them all? Oh, my God. What if you caught them all? 
You know that feeling, that warm, that amazing feeling when you've been a useful, when you've been a tool in the master's hands, when, when you caught it, the pain in someone and you, and you were there for them? What if you caught them all? Man, that'd, that'd, be like the, that'd be like the buzz that never wore off, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> amazing stuff. Two, two points, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph. It talks about this inspiration. It says, <clears throat> we relax, we take it easy, we don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we've tried this for a while. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Every, I, I would imagine that every one of you at some point in your life has had that intuitive thing. Now, whether you listen to it or not, I, I've had it a, a lot of times in my life, and I roll over it because my ego is louder, right? I'll roll over it and not get it. I, I had a, a situation years ago where I, I, God was talking through my intuition. I had an employee that had been with me a number of years and had been a good employee, and for no logical reason, my gut's telling me this person's stealing from me. No lot. There was no evidence. There was nothing on the radar that it would even imply that this is this person's been a stellar employee for all these years. But something in here is like a red light going off. The problem is I'm I'm so inexperienced with this stuff, and I've listened to my head a lot longer than I've ever listened to my intuition. And I rolled right over it. I wouldn't because here I start you know even thinking about it. I have these conversations in my head. The conversations go like. Oh my God, you can't, you just can't fire someone and ruin their whole life on a sense. I mean, you can't do that. And what would, here's the big one, what would people say? What would people think of you if you did that? It'd be a terrible thing to do. What if you're wrong? What, what? So I never acted on it. But I, I did take some, I tried to put little traps out, see if I could catch her steal. Never could catch her stealing. Well, over the next couple of years, I almost, that, that particular business almost went under. And I eventually got to the point where it's I either have to make a change here and get rid of her or I'm going to lose everything. And I got rid of her. The minute I got rid of her, the numbers started coming back up again. I could never catch her. She went to work for my competition. He caught her with a video camera, caught her stealing. I figure in, in my not listening to my intuition for those two years, it cost me 250000 or more. But that was a tough year. That was, a t that, was the, that was the year where I had to sell some property in order to give my employees their bonuses. Tough year. All because I wouldn't listen. God's, God's talking to me, but I, I'm listening to this more. And, and, and the, the book cautions me about this. It, it, it says being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God, it's not probable that I'm going to be inspired at all times. And if I, suspect, if I think that I am, what mechanism in me would think that I'm inspired at all times? Not my spirit. Right, not my spirit. My spirit's too humble for that. My spirit would just go, ah, I don't know. My ego goes, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. And I, now, one of the things that the ego will tell you, here's what the ego tells me. Well, Bob. God, you're 30 years sober. <laughs> you're not inexperienced anymore. Matter of fact, Bob, you should probably be teaching classes on this. Huh? <laughs> Bob, you're, you're, you know, Bob. Honestly and objectively, I'll tell you how inexperienced I am. If you were to chart my contact and listening and direction that I've taken in my life based on my intuition against how much direction and actions I've taken in my life based on my thinking and feelings that the intuition would be a little drop in a huge bucket I am very over in the big picture objectively if I step back from myself I don't I don't can't even think in my lifetime I could even I couldn't even get halfway up to the curve yet, let alone get ahead of it. I can't. I, I'll. Ne I can't do it. 
I've been listening to my head in my life a lot more than I've ever listened to my stomach. A lot more. I am, I am inexperienced. And I try to do this stuff every day. I got to tell you something. I'm inexperienced. And I have just made conscious contact. You always, no matter where, how long you're sober, you've just made, because, because it doesn't take, it doesn't take for anybody. It comes and it goes. It's like the tides. Nobody stays plugged. And if you run into somebody that's plugged in 100% consciously to God all the time, I'm telling you they're going to lie about other things. <laughs> Nobody's plugged in all. If you could stay plugged in all the time, we would not need step 10 and 11. Right? You should just be plugged in. So I disconnect and reconnect and disconnect. So no matter where I am, I have just made conscious contact with God and I I check I have a sponsor uh, I for the most part I, I do let some things slip through the cracks um, so I get lucky sometimes and the things that I let slip through the cracks I don't talk to him about work out sometimes they don't sometimes I'm embarrassed I wish I would have talked to him about that and, but I try for the most part to keep him current on the things that seem to be a legitimate piece of business in my life. I, I really have tried not to allow myself the natural inclination to, to, to create a secret life, to compartmentalize my life. Chamberlain used to talk about you can't compartmentalize yourself. In other words, you have to be the same person at work as you are in your home group, as you are in your relationship, as you are with your kids, as you are at church. You can't be, I, I know a guy in, in Vegas that he's, a, he's so spiritual in AA meetings, but he'll rip you off in business. And you know what he says? He says, well, that's business. How do you do that? How do you compart? It, I've never been able to do it. It bleeds in. It bleeds over. I've never been, if, God, if you could do that, then you could get, I could get away with a lot of crap over here, 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 as long as I was good over there. I've never been able to do that. I don't think anybody can do it legitimately. I don't, compart I don't compartmentalize my life. Uh, I, I think the whole purpose of this is to bring us into integrity. And integrity just means oneness. I have, I'm one person. I, I want to be the same person I am with you that I am with him. I want to be the same person with my daughter that I am in the grocery store. I want to be the same person in traffic that I am in my home group. I want to be the same guy. Not a perfect guy. Uh, I take I take me every I take me in every one of those areas. Uh, a guy struggling, caught between the grace of God and self. Um, there's a. It says we may presume if we presume to be inspired at all times, we're going to pay for this presumption and all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Oh my, I I think we ought to put out a book. In Alcoholics Anonymous for <coughs> conference approved literature called Absurd Actions and Ideas. <laughs> or my friend Scott, who I just loved, he died a little while ago. He just to say he used to talk about the, the book of newcomer plans. <laughs> yeah. The middle of the second the next paragraph, it says we ask especially for self will and are careful to make no request for ourselves only. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing this, and it doesn't work. You can easily see why. Can you? Can you see why you don't pray for yourself? I had a friend that used to say years ago that he believed the mo one of the most important words in all the 12 steps was the word only in step 11. We pray only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. In the second commandment, it says that uh, I shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I was raised to believe that that meant that I'm not supposed to cuss. And that's not that's not bad. I mean, it may, I don't think cussing, I try not to cuss. I mean, I slips out once in a while. And I try not to because I try to be other-centered enough to realize that there might be somebody in the room that it would shut them down or offend them, and I would not want to. I don't want to do that. But it, I don't think that's what the second commandment really means. What 
objectively, what would be the vainest use of God's name? Wouldn't it be to pray for my will? I mean, can you imagine anything vainer than that? Here's the creator of the universe. He's been running the universe very well now for billions of years. But Bob's here now. And I'm going to instruct God. I'm going to tell him, oh, God, make my, make my friend's cancer go away. God, make this IRS audit go well. Uh, make my, my daughter be, get along with so-and-so. Make, 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 make. As if I know. It's a sup from the moment I would petition God for my will, I'm putting myself back in the position of playing God. It's almost like when you go to your boss and you tell him how he should do his job, aren't you playing the boss? Right? That I that I've un when I do that, I've undid the decision in step three, because now it's no longer for him to build and do now it's for me to build and do and the, I, I i've had it backwards a lot of my life where the proper the book says the proper use of the will is to align my my will with god's not to try to talk him into something prayer is not a, a way to bargain with god to get your own way uh, my friend my dear friend clint used to say there were three types of prayers and he said all prayer is good but every but each type is a little better than the than the pr type before. He said the, the the lowest type of prayer is the help me prayer. Well, every alcoholic said the help. Even if you're an atheist, you've said that. In, in jail, you've said that. Help me, and I'll never do this again. We said also the help me prayer. And then there's the give me prayer. Uh, the serenity prayer is actually a give me prayer. That's why I'm not real big on the serenity prayer, because you're I'm instructing God. Grant me the serenity. And Clint said the ultimate prayer that is, a, that is perfectly in line with our principles is simply use me. Use me. No prejudice, no opinion. Just use me. How can I help? Um, Ralph. So step 11 sounds a lot like step 10. Talked about it briefly. We're going to finish up with 11 so then we can get to 12. And 11 sounds like 10, and if you're anything like me, you want to know what's the difference. I remember going into a meeting when I was about maybe four months sober, and the meeting was on step 11, which I couldn't wait to share on, though I was probably on step three, you know, but I couldn't <laughs> wait to share on step 11. Sometimes, have you ever, if you've been doing this a while, do you ever think of some things you did in your early days and kind of cringe right now, thinking about all the people who were at that meeting? So I got up there and I did my sharing on step 11 and I informed everybody. I know that people, common knowledge is that you should work the steps chronologically, but that's not true because I've been working step 11 already and I started from the time I came. And I, and I meant it. I've been praying since the time I came in here, so I've been doing the 11th step. You know, and the eleven step talks about sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact, meaning I have to what? Have a conscious contact. And how did I affect the conscious contact? Four through nine. Didn't know it. So a prayer is fine. All the praying I've done in all the steps, we did the help me prayer in the first step. We did a third step prayer. We had prayers in the fourth step. We had a prayer in the fifth. We had a seventh step prayer. We did some prayers when we did the ninth step. So prayer is throughout. But this is specific, you know, uh, to improve my conscience all through prayer and meditation. That's the means. That's the method. But the purpose, to improve my conscious contact with God is understanding praying only for knowledge of his will and the power to carry it out. So that's the 11th step. I have a conscious contact. I want to grow it. I want to grow it, improve my conscious contact with this power. And the 10th and 11th, they sound very much. So how do they play out in life? Remember what we talk about. This is a design for living, and this is the way I live my life. So now I've got this new way of living, and I'm living life, and I'm bopping through my day. And as I go through my day, I... You know, I encounter Alan, and we have a good experience, and I encounter Steve, and we have a good experience. And I encounter Marty, and we have a good experience. And then I run into Kate, and she says something I don't like, and I kind of say something short, snappy to her, and I realize it, and I say, I'm sorry, God, I shouldn't have done that. You know, and I go through my day, and I tell them, you know, I withhold something from myself. So as I'm, I'm, as I'm going through my, my day, 
because I'm on this different plane now, and I'm watching for certain stuff. It sounds hard. God, this self-examination deal you guys are talking about. So all through the day, I'm on guard for how am I going to get anything done? I'm sitting here looking at working part of who I am. It'll become a working part of who I am. As I go through my, I'm just living. But when I bump heads with somebody, now that's real clear to me. It'll become second nature. You know, I'm walking around at work and I'm pissed off and it's all, I got a resentment at the boss. It'll be right there in front of me. It's not something, so don't worry about it, the way it plays out. And so I address it right then. I might go in my office. I might call my sponsor. Look, man, I got this resentment at the bottom. I might share it with him. He might give me some instruction. Then I might go directly. Bob, you know what the meeting we had this morning when I cut you off? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. So I'm doing stuff directly. So that's the 10th step, and I go through my day. And then I go home, and the 11th step is broken up into three parts. We're just going to bullet point them. Rob gave us the overview, so let's bullet point so I'll know for myself what to do in this step. And the first part of the 11th step is the nightly review. First part, three parts to the 11th step. First part is the nightly review. And in the nightly review, see, the deal about the nightly review, and this is why it's so important that the 11th step is at the 11th step, because I don't have the power to do an effective night. I think people probably should be examining. If you're new, to the best of your ability, examine yourself and examine what it is that you do right now. Minimize damage. Do damage control. You'll still be doing some stuff, but minimize it. Still, you know, as people, just as a thinking person, you know, uh, with some stuff I grew up with, I can try to keep my mouth closed. I can try to not hurt people. I grew up with that in kindergarten, you know. So there are some things I can do, but there are other things that require a lot of power on my part. I don't have the power to do the nightly review very early because I am going to drift. When I lay down at night and I start thinking, I'm going to, I don't have the power to not drift into worry, remorse, or more of a re Oh, man, I sounded so stupid. When I did the deal, I did a deal at a meeting. I was leading a meeting in my home group, new meeting. We have participation meetings. And for us, we call the lead, you know, different places in the country, I don't call them different things. But the leader leads the meeting. He picks the people who's going to share at the, at the, we call them participation. You guys call them discussion meetings. He picked the people, and we say the leader qualifies. He's supposed to share maybe five to seven minutes. Well, I'm about 15 minutes in the sharing because I'm sharing everything I know in 90 days. And, you know, and I'm sharing everything that I've heard somebody like Bob Darrell share. I'm sharing everything I've heard Steve share. Just all my knowledge that you guys have never heard. You've never heard if you don't drink, you don't get drunk. You've never heard feelings are not facts. You've never heard this stuff. And it's all new. You know when you're new and you hear stuff for the first time, you think that, oh, my God, they have. And you wonder why people are sitting in there and they aren't as excited as you, but you pass it on. You know? <laughs> and so I'm sharing all this. And an old timer stood up in the back. And he said, to this day I cringe. And he said, you know, you got to know my home group, Middle Hood. This ain't no speaker meeting. Thank you for letting me share. And I sat down and I'm mortified, right? I am mortified. And people that tried to help me, they made it worse because I'm thinking everybody notices and everybody knows I'm embarrassed. <laughs> and people after the meeting were saying, don't worry about it, Rock Cleo does that there. And I'm like, oh, this makes it worse. They did know. Everybody does notice. And man, for years. <laughs> so I go home. Here's where it goes into. And I'm in the bed. I can't sleep that night. I'm embarrassed to go back to my home group, but I go back to my home group because this is embedded in me by now. You go to meetings, you go. But I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm mortified. I'll never recover an alcoholic. So this deal about when we go to bed at night and reflect on our day, trust me, use that one judiciously. Make sure you at the 11th step because you probably don't have the ability not to reflect. So it gives some instructions for what to do at night. How is that different than the 10th? Bob said it looks like a more in-depth Tim step. Well, it anticipates guys like Ralph. So it gives me a belt and it gives me suspenders. I'm double covered. Throughout the day, if I'm vigilant and if I watch, most of the time, and I'll get better at it. You know, Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player ever, you know, he doesn't have an 80% shooting percentage. 
He doesn't have a 60% shooting percentage. He probably has a high 40s. He missed more than he made. And I, I imagine when he got on that blacktop and he first started, he wasn't winning games all the time. How did he get to be Michael? To practice, 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 practice. So I'll miss these resentments early on. Practice. I'll, I, you know, I'll do some stuff. Practice. You know, I'll get pissed. A practice. <laughs> you know. I'll drop the ball. I'll say something inappropriate and practice. I will be sitting in the intergroup meeting cheering, and somebody will invite me to the parking lot and not for a discussion, and I will take the invitation. Practice. <laughs> practice. Practice. You know, it's not going to happen. I'm, remember, I'm an event guy. I'm an event guy. I'm not a process guy. I don't trust process. I don't trust long term. I want to give me the solution now. I take it now. I'm done. That's not how a spiritual life goes. Spiritual life, spiritual path is a series of corrections and adjustments. Bob just talked about it. If you have a brand new car, brand new, perfectly aligned, I guarantee you, you could be the only person on the highway and you could be going straight. I dare you to just try to drive without your hand on the wheel. I dare you to drive a mile without your hand on the wheel. Perfectly aligned car, brand new, highway clear of nobody. You'll have a, one car, it's about, spiritual life is the same way. I could think I am just perfectly in tune, fourth step, yeah, ninth step, done. I'm doing 10, uh, life, a series of corrections and adjustments. Corrections and adjustments, you know. And so I'm doing this 10th, okay. Then what's the repurpose? But even in doing the day, I'm me. Some of it is I'm me. You know, I am so self-willed. Default position goes back to self-will. That's why it says that we've been kind and love, kind and loving towards all. Because I better try for all. Because if I don't try for all, it's probably gonna be none. My <laughs> default is none. Right. My default is none. I gotta try for all to get a third, or, or to get, to get right. twenty percent at the beginning. You know, I gotta try everything we do. When we talked about it in the seventh step, it says we ask God, can He now take them all? You know. We say for ourselves, we aim for him taking them all, because who I am, I better aim for all to just get, you know, that 10% at the beginning. You let me aim for less than all. I'm going to get less than that whatever I was going to get by aiming for all. So the, the all, that's what that is. It's a perfect ideal for a guy like me whose perfect default is done. So, so that's the perfect ideal. But anyway, back to why this 11 sounds like this 10, because I miss stuff. Same reason I still write four steps, even though I'm doing 10 steps. Because over a year or two years' time, I'm going to miss stuff. I'm going to miss things. How do you know, Ralph, in a real way? Let me put flesh on it in a real way. Yeah, did 10 steps all this year. I, 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 had an, I have an inventory at home. I have an inventory at home. And sometimes the way that I know I miss stuff is by writing. Sometimes you won't know till you do the action of. And I started with just my son because I couldn't live with myself and the havoc I was wreaking in my house whenever we would interact. And I knew this is something I got to put on paper. This is more than just step to him and no. And then I did him and me being me. While I'm at it, I might as well do the self. Is it somebody? Names pop up. Next thing you know, you know, I got about six names. Not about, I have six names. You know, the newcomers I started out with, I can't tell you how many were my early ones. My inventories now usually range from maybe three to seven names. You know, um, But anyway, that 11th step is because I don't catch everybody during the day. And I don't know that I didn't catch it till I'm laying in bed at night. And I'm reviewing my day. So now it's a mini uh, inventory. So now I'm looking at what it was that got through the cracks during the day in the nightly review. I'm asking myself virtually the same questions I asked myself in the tenth in a little more depth. That's the nightly review. Second part of the 11th step, morning meditation. Morning meditation. 
So actually the 11th step is divided and it goes over a couple. At the end of a day, I review my day. Now it goes over in the starting my next day. When I start my next day, it's the morning review, the morning meditation. And in the morning meditation, it's all laid out right here. And I ask myself, I review what it is I'm going through today. I, I review my, my plans for the day. And I ask God, there's a prayer. You know, the divorce it from self-pity, worry. Bob already went through all that. There's a prayer in the morning. And I align myself upon leaving my house. You know, uh, kind of like stopping at the gas station. I get fueled up. I'm at my gas station. I get fueled up for my day. I need to be powered, you know. And so I, I stop in there at the gas. And so that's the morning meditation, second part. And then the third part um, of the 11th step is at the bottom of page 87. I've got that nightly review. I've got the morning meditation. And this third part of the 11th step really sounds as if it's kind of go hand in hand with the 10th step throughout the day. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. Stop. I think I need to cut some. Stop. We pause when agitated. You can use agitated as a, as a synonym for a lot of words. We pause when frustrated. We pause when depressed. We pause when pissed off. We pause when angry. We pause when burned up. We pause when in right. conflict. When right. We pause when right, especially. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Good one, but when I'm when I know I'm right, that's your that's your cue. <laughs> Pause. Think about yourself as, as if you're a DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting wet. Stop. Feel it coming out and just hit the pause. Okay. Remind myself. And and now when I'm in pause, when I'm getting ready. When I'm getting ready to let them have it, because somebody needs to. And see, here's where the right comes in. You could be at a meeting, and, and here's, here's, you know you're in the danger zone when you're looking out for the newcomer. Remember Bob's resentment last night when he was going to talk to the guy who, who had just got the cancer diagnosis? And besides, I'm sure if I don't check him right now, he's doing this to other new guys. <laughs> Whenever I'm protecting the, the meeting for, and on behalf of the newcomers, it's probably me. <laughs> it's probably me. You know. Probably me. So pause when right. Pause when agitated. Okay, God, give me the right thought or action. And sometimes, even though it's written in here, the right thought or action sometimes is inaction or feels like inaction. Sometimes inaction is the right action. Don't do what you're getting ready to do. And don't say what you're getting ready to say. Pause when agitated. Then constantly, Ralph, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Reminding ourselves we are no longer running the show. Some people, when you're at work, remember what side of the check you signed. <laughs> I got to remember I signed the back of the check. I don't sign the front of the check. <laughs> Reminding myself. <laughs> I humbly say to myself, thy will be done. And that's how it plays out in real life. That's how 10 and 11 play out in real life. I go through my day, you know, and, and so at night I review, see if I missed anything. See if I didn't promptly address it in the way of a 10 step. In the morning I get ready for my day. I do a morning meditation. And throughout the day I'm watching and I'm pausing when agitated. I, then I'm in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, foolish decisions. I become more efficient. It doesn't say I become more godly. It doesn't say I become more self-right. I become more efficient. I keep telling you I'm a kind of a pragmatic guy. You can see I'm more pragmatic. I become more efficient. Remember the words that are coming up in this 10th and 11th step? Useful, efficient, you know. We don't tire so easily. We are not trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. And now here we come to 
what we put on the board a little while ago. We alcoholics are undisciplined. So we let God discipline us in the simple way we have just outlined. And it becomes a discipline. Bad word to me. I don't like discipline. Principal's office, vice principal's office, authority. I'm a maverick guy by nature, you know. But I understand this level of discipline, and it's a discipline. And like in any discipline, what I practice, 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 practice. That idea of meditation, guarantee you. I probably will start out three minutes tops, if that. Meditation, you usually start out something like, okay, I'm going to get quiet. Why am I quiet? I can't, okay, you said you're getting quiet. All right, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quiet for real. You know. Shh, okay, you're quiet now. What's that? Oh, man, I can't even get quiet. What's, you know, th th that's how it starts for me, you know. Okay, I know I'm supposed to be meditating. Okay. They said practice. I sure will be glad when I can get further along. And that's how I start, you know. May not make a minute. Practice, practice, practice. You know, become a working part of my experience. But this is not all. There is action and more action. Faith without works is dead. This is about the third time the book says that. Faith without works is dead. The next chapter is entirely devoted to step 12. Are we going to go all the way through? Or Which one we take a, a short break? We'll come back and read 12. We're going to take a real short break, then we're going to.